In the eighth year of manned flight into space, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration prepared men and equipment for the most advanced manned mission to date. Apollo 8, NASA's 17th manned space flight, took three American astronauts on a far-reaching half-million-mile journey into orbit around the moon and back to Earth. The historic six-day, three-hour mission of Apollo 8 demonstrated the performance of many activities required for the success of future manned flights, including landing men on the moon and returning them safely to Earth. The performance of the Apollo Saturn V, America's most powerful space vehicle, was again demonstrated on this mission. The three-stage Saturn V launch vehicle had been qualified for the Apollo 8 flight, its first manned mission, by two successful unmanned launches. The flightworthiness of the command and service modules of the Apollo spacecraft had been proven on previous missions, including the 11-day manned Earth orbital mission of the Apollo 7. The ability of man to function normally, to perform specific activities, and to navigate the Apollo spacecraft on a distant flight were demonstrated by the three-man crew of Apollo 8. Frank Borman, a veteran of the Gemini program, was command pilot for the mission. James A. Lovell, who had participated in two Gemini flights, was command module pilot. And William A. Anders was lunar module pilot. NASA and crew confidence in the Apollo 8 mission was very high. Although difficult, it was one of the least complicated of possible lunar missions and was well within the design capabilities of the Apollo Saturn V space vehicle. The mission also contained several commit points, at which times mission control and the astronaut crew had options to proceed with the planned mission or, if necessary, switch to an alternate mission plan. In demonstrating the performance of the crew, the Apollo Saturn V space vehicle and the mission support facilities on a manned lunar mission, Apollo 8 accomplished the first of its primary mission objectives. The second primary objective was concerned with planned activities performed during the mission, including translunar injection, command service module navigation, communications, and mid-course corrections. An assessment of fuel and other items consumed on the mission and passive thermal control, that is, external temperature control of the command service modules in deep space. The 28-hour final countdown for Apollo 8 was begun on the night of December 19th by the manned launch operations team at Kennedy Space Center. The launch date for Apollo 8, set in November, was maintained throughout the rigorous checkout and countdown of the complex Apollo Saturn V space vehicle. In the early morning hours of December 21st, the three-man crew of Apollo 8 boarded the NASA transfer van and began their journey to the launch pad at Complex 39. They arrived at the base of the pad about three hours before liftoff. Elevators carried the crew to the 320-foot level of the launch tower, from where they crossed the Apollo access arm and entered the white room. With monitors in the launch control center indicating all spacecraft and launch vehicle systems functioning normally, the astronauts entered the spacecraft. The countdown proceeded smoothly with no unscheduled holds. About four minutes before liftoff, the last manual check of all launch consoles was completed. At T minus three minutes and seven seconds, an automatic sequencer took over the countdown. As the clock reached T minus eight and nine tenths seconds, the engines of the first stage were ignited.
six million pound apollo saturn space vehicle slowly rose from its launch pad and then climbed into space at an accelerating speed lift off of apollo eight was recorded at seven fifty one a m eastern standard time precisely on schedule the launch azimuth was exactly seventy two degrees At an altitude of 36 miles, the center engine of the first stage shut down. 28 seconds later, the four outside engines shut down and separation of the stages took place. The one million pound thrust of the second stage raised the speed and altitude of Apollo 8 to 6,800 miles per hour, 106 miles above Earth. At 8 minutes 44 seconds into the flight, Mission Control in Houston, Texas confirmed second stage shutdown and separation. The third stage was then ignited for the first time to place itself and the Apollo spacecraft a 283,000 pound payload into a planned 119 mile high Earth parking orbit. During two revolutions of the Earth, the crew checked spacecraft and launch vehicle systems in preparation for reignition of the third stage and insertion into a lunar trajectory. A similar check was conducted at mission control. This was the first commit point in the flight. After careful evaluation of all systems in the space vehicle and of all ground tracking stations, Mission Control gave the go-ahead for translunar insertion. Apollo 8 Houston, you're looking good here, right down the center line. Roger, Apollo 8. Apollo 8, coming up on 20 seconds to ignition. Mark it, and you're looking very good. Roger. The third stage engine was reignited at 2 hours, 50 minutes, and 36 seconds into the flight. The engine burned for 5 minutes and 19 seconds, raising Apollo 8 speed to a velocity of 24,200 miles per hour, thrusting Apollo from Earth orbit toward the moon. For the first time, man had left his home planet to begin a translunar flight through space. The third stage had performed its function perfectly. And 20 minutes after translunar insertion, spacecraft separation occurred. Following a short period of station keeping, the spacecraft moved away in preparation for third stage fuel dump. The remaining liquid oxygen in the third stage was then released which increased the velocity of the stage on a new trajectory. This eliminated the possibility of recontact with the spacecraft by placing the stage in a trajectory passing behind the moon and into solar orbit. At six hours and 33 minutes into the flight, the astronauts tested the S-band high gain steerable antenna. Flown for the first time, this small 70 inch wide antenna was used for most of the two-way transmissions between the spacecraft and mission control. The small antenna performed better than predicted. In contrast, 
at three points on Earth, huge 85-foot antenna stations were used for all telemetry, voice communications, and TV transmissions up to lunar distances. Passive thermal control of the spacecraft was then initiated and maintained throughout the mission except during periods of navigation sightings, photography, and television transmissions. Thermal control is vital to the success of distant manned space flight and involves rotating the spacecraft slowly so that excessive heat will not build up on the surface facing the sun. A short time later, the crew removed their pressure suits. They wore lightweight flight suits throughout the remainder of the mission. The first mid-course correction maneuver was initiated at 11 hours. A 2.4 second burn of the service propulsion engine increased the spacecraft velocity by 24 and one half feet per second. The resulting trajectory was so accurate that the planned second and third maneuvers were not required. Command pilot Borman experienced some nausea at 19 hours. The two other crewmen also reported a feeling of queasiness. Following medication and a sleep period, all three men felt well and rested. They experienced no further physical problems. The first of six television transmissions was initiated on the second day of the flight at about 31 hours. Apollo 8, uh, Houston, uh, we just got it. You aren't getting it. He's on Candy's camera. Very good. Okay, Apollo 8, we have a good picture. We're rolling, okay, we're rolling around to a uh, good view of the Earth. And uh, as soon as we get to the uh, good view of the Earth, we'll stop and let you look out the window at the scene we see. Jim Wobble's down in the lower equipment bay preparing uh, lunch. And, uh, and Bill is uh, holding a camera here for us both. Throughout the translunar flight, the astronauts conducted star, Earth horizon, and lunar sightings to demonstrate the accuracy of onboard navigation and evaluate the optical subsystem for future deep space manned missions. For the first time, Man took photographs of the receding Earth, as well as many of the approach to the moon. During the translunar flight, the Earth's gravitational pull gradually decreased Apollo 8's velocity to 2,170 miles per hour. Then, as lunar gravity overcame the Earth's diminishing pull, spacecraft velocity increased. As Apollo 8 neared the moon, Another extensive evaluation of all systems was conducted by the crew and mission control. If no further maneuvers were made, the spacecraft would circle the moon and head back to Earth on a free return trajectory. However, mission control and the astronauts decided to commit for lunar orbit. On Christmas Eve, at 69 hours and 8 minutes, the service module propulsion system was fired to de-boost the spacecraft into lunar orbit. The initial elliptical orbit was 69 by 193 miles above the lunar surface. After a complete systems check and confirmation from mission control, a second burn of the service propulsion system engine circularized the orbit to a planned 69 miles above the moon. For the first time, man looked upon the surface of the moon with his unaided eyes and saw greater detail than ever before. Houston, uh, what does the old moon look like from 60 miles, over? Okay, uh, Houston, the moon is essentially gray. <coughs> no color. Looks like plaster of Paris. Yeah, or uh, sort of a grayish beach sand. We can see quite a bit of detail. Uh, the sea of fertility doesn't stand out as well here as it does back on Earth. Not much contrast between that and the surrounding craters. Well, the equator craters are all rounded off. There's quite a few of them. Some of them are newer. Some look like, uh, especially the round ones, look like uh, 
hit by meteorites or projectiles of some sort. These history-making scenes were transmitted to the world via television from Apollo 8 in orbit of the moon. During lunar orbit, the astronauts were out of communication contact for about 45 minutes each time they moved behind the moon. On the dark side of the moon, tracking and general photography of the lunar surface was performed. On the light side of the moon, lunar landmark sightings and tracking of potential landing areas for future missions were conducted. A huge crater and other prominent Lorraine features were photographed including a high mountain in the center of a crater on the back side of the moon. The astronauts also turned their cameras toward a bright object on the horizon, the Earth shining in space, with much more brightness than the moonshine we've seen so often from our planet. After 10 lunar revolutions, a total of about 20 hours in lunar orbit, the astronauts prepared for trans-Earth injection and returned to their home planet. Reignition of the service propulsion system to escape the pull of lunar gravity was critical. On the back side of the moon, at 89 hours 19 minutes, on prior direction from mission control, the astronauts fired the engine of the service module for 203 seconds. It was Christmas morning on Earth, and the nation waited for recontact with the astronauts. orbited the moon and looked upon its surface. He had tracked and photographed potential landing sites for future manned missions. He had accomplished the age-old dream of traveling to the moon and now was on his way home to Earth. During the two-day, nine-hour return trip to Earth, additional navigational sightings were performed and communication and thermal control tests conducted. Apollo 8's primary guidance and navigation system was operated automatically for controlling the spacecraft's return trajectory. Mission Control updated return course information to the command module computer at least every 10 hours. A planned mid-course correction was initiated at the 15th hour of trans-Earth flight. A velocity correction of only 5 feet per second ensured entry into the Earth's atmosphere within the mathematically computed Earth entry corridor. Again, because of the accuracy of the trajectory, planned second and third corrections were not required. As I look down uh, on the Earth here, so far out in space, I uh, think I must have the feeling that the travelers in the old sailing ships used to have. You're going on a very long voyage away from home, and uh, now we're headed back. And uh, I have that feeling of being proud of the trip, but still uh, still happy to be going back home and back to our home port. This is Frank Borman. We, uh, we've enjoyed the uh, television shows, and I uh, invite you to stay uh, tuned in in the future because there'll be flights and uh, rendezvous in the Earth orbit, and then, of course, there'll be television from the lunar surface itself in the not too far distant future. So until then... On December 27th, as Apollo 8 approached Earth, the spacecraft was manually maneuvered in preparation for separation from the service module. Fifteen minutes before atmospheric entry, 
that command module separated from the service module. The spacecraft was then automatically maneuvered to the proper attitude for entry. Traveling 24,530 miles per hour, Apollo 8 began Earth entry seven and one half miles above the Western Pacific Ocean. As Apollo 8 streaked through the Pacific night, an airborne camera photographed the blazing trail of the spacecraft and its ablative material. Following a direct descent flight path, Apollo 8 traveled 1,560 miles across the Earth's surface and splashed down in the Pacific with pinpoint accuracy, less than four miles from its recovery ship. The first night landing of a manned spacecraft brought the epical lunar journey to an end with the precision that characterized the entire mission. Apollo 8 had splashed down on target and on schedule at six days, two hours, and 59 minutes after liftoff. On man's first flight to the moon, all primary mission objectives had been completely accomplished. Every detailed test objective had been met, as well as five which were not originally planned. While overwhelming praise was given to astronauts Borman, Lovell, and Anders for their historic accomplishment, just praise was also given to the Apollo launch and mission teams, who had coped with many difficult constraints in carrying out the complicated launch and mission. Apollo 8 climaxed a year of manned spaceflight progress and demonstrated with awesome perfection the capability of United States crews and equipment to fly into space beyond the equilibrium point of the Earth's gravitational pull. With the historic flight of Apollo 8 to the moon and back in the closing days of 1968, mankind entered a new era of unlimited dimensions and the United States became truly a space-faring nation.